Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're talking about generative testing. Now, if you haven't heard of generative testing before, that's okay. We're going to start with some unit tests and then move on to generative tests. Now, if you're already familiar with unit tests, eh, maybe just skip ahead or think about something else for the next few minutes. I'm going to introduce unit tests for the purpose of showing where the holes are in unit tests, and then we can switch over and do some generative tests. We're going to start with the super boring classic examples for generative testing, and then I promise it'll get more interesting. We'll be implementing all of these functions, but we're going to start with addition and multiplication, because that will give us a feel for what generative tests are for. Now, on the right here, we have some unit tests for ag and for malt, and you can see that, that unit tests are tests by example. So it says that add should return the sum of two numbers. And then the examples that we give are 2 and 3 should be 5, 88 and 12 should be 100. So obviously we know how to implement add. It's not, you know, rocket surgery. Let's just return that. And now we should have one passing test. And we do. Instead of two specs, two failures, we now have two specs, one failure. The specs are these guys on the right, and the tests are obviously, or the functions themselves are the guys on the left. So now we want to get malt working based on our examples. So it should return the product of two numbers. And the examples that we give are two and three should be six, four and 50 should be 200. And you can see right now undefined it was expected to be 200, and that's because we're just implicitly returning undefined. So let's return x times y, and that should give us passing unit tests. Now, what is the problem here? The problem is that, you know, if you were to be a real scumbag developer, you could do something like check if x is 2 and 3 and y is 3, and then return 5, and then check if x is 88 and y is 12 and return 100 and under any other circumstance fail, but you'll pass the tests. So you're good, right? Well, not really. You have, you, you've just written code to pass the tests. You haven't written code that actually meets the described behavior. And that's not necessarily your fault in certain situations. Uh, it's the limitation of unit tests. And so all unit tests can do are run tests based on examples. Now that works really well for creating a quick development cycle. So if you're doing test-driven development <clears throat> where you write your tests first and then you write code to make those tests pass, then you have this really quick turnaround. You notice how every time I saved in the top left corner, it would show the result of the unit tests. And that's great. The problem is that we have all these holes in our uh, testing framework. And so generative tests are also called uh, randomized or property-based tests. And like the name suggests, they describe properties of a function and then run random tests to prove that those properties actually uh, hold true, regardless of input. So let's hop over to our generative tests. So spec, generative, and there's main spec, yeah. All right, so down here, I suppose I'll, I'll put in a comment here just to make it easier to see. We have some properties that we're trying to describe of add and mult. So they should be commutative, meaning that no matter the order of the arguments, they should always be the same. So we expect add 6.5 to be the same as add 5.6. And it should have an identity of 0, meaning that if you pass in a 1 and a 0, the result should be 1. But what we lack here is that, excuse me, that randomization. We're still testing based on example. Even though it's a property, it's testing based on the specifics of 6 and 5. All we can say for sure is that if you pass in 6 and 5 or 5 and 6, the result is the same, not any value. So if you, look, if you maybe had you know, careful eyes, you'd see that I had check.it instead of just it. And that's because I'm using a Jasmine check library which allows me to do randomized testing. And that gives me access to a gen object. So I can generate a random integer and pass those random integers in as x and y. And then I can use them down here. And so we can say x and y should be the same as y and x. 
And that is a true property. We're not saying that 5 and 6 should be the same as 6 and 5. We're saying no matter what x is, no matter what y is, assuming they are valid inputs, meaning integers, they should be the same result no matter what order they're passed in, which is pretty cool. And then we can do the same thing down here. Should have an identity of 0. We'll assign a value of x to a random integer. And no matter what that integer is, the result should always be x if one of the values it passed in is 0. And so this gives us very broad coverage of the add function. Now it's nothing exciting. We're basically just testing if the plus operator works properly in JavaScript. But it gives us a sense of how this works. And we can do the same thing with mult. So mult should also be commutative. So let's add an x and a y up here. And random integers. And same dealio, x, y. x, y. And instead of an identity of 0, if you multiply anything by 1, you get itself back. So the identity is 1 instead of 0. So we'll return x, so the random value, if the second value or first value, it doesn't really matter, is 1. And we know it doesn't matter because it's commutative. Now, generative tests are very slow. So you'll see that the unit test ran because I saved this file, but all of our tests will only run if I do npm run test. Now you can see my, <laughs> my last failure from the uh, development cycle for this video. And there we go, all of our tests pass. Excellent. So that ran all of our unit tests and our generative tests. But you'll notice it took a little bit longer. It doesn't take too long to generate random integers, but it actually generated 100 random test cases for this one, 100 random test cases for this one, 100 random for this one, 100 random for this one. So this doesn't fit into a typical test-driven development, development cycle, but it does give you this extra coverage that you might miss with unit tests. And we'll actually see how that comes up later. So, remove that, save this, and let's switch back to our unit tests and start implementing some more of these functions. Oops. Okay, so the real meat and potatoes of what we're working towards is this team score function. Team score is going to take a table. A table is going to be represented as an object. And it, so you can think of it as the response from a database query or whatever. And each key or each property is going to point to a array. And each array is going to represent a column. And then you can think of these as being rows. So red and two are in the same row. So this, the team, red team got two points. Red team got three points. Green team got four points. Red team got five points. Green team got zero points. And what team score is going to do is take this input table and a team to summarize the score for, and it will return the sum of points for that team. So in this case, we had 2 plus 3 plus 5, which is going to be 10. And we've also got an example here where it says blah. There is no team called blah, so the result should be 0. All right, seems straightforward enough. We just want... This is perhaps part of a user story where the user could put in a team that they want summarized into an input field, hit a button to get the summary for all the points for that team, and then they want to be able to be shown the result. So we're going to implement that code. So let's just unhide this guy here. Team score. Team score. So we know it's going to take a table. And it's going to take a team. And the first thing we want to do is pair up each of these scores with a team. So right now, we just have two columns, but we don't have a real sense of what's in the same row other than by index. So if we do something like pairs equals zip, and then we zip together table.team, so the, in this case, you know, red, red, green, red, green, and table.team, or sorry, table.score. 
So in this case, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0. Sorry for it folding over there. I'm trying to cram a ton onto the screen. So what zip does is zip takes a pair of arrays and returns an array of pairs. But we haven't implemented that yet. So if I were to run this, this is going to fail because we don't actually have that yet. Or because I haven't uncommented describe yet, then it'll be fine. There we go. Now we get an issue because zip is not defined. So that means that we have to implement zip. Now zip is common in functional programming. And so we can just create a zip function down here. And it will take a pair of arrays. So we'll destructure those into the two separate arrays. And we'll just uh, look at our unit test down here to see exactly what we're talking about. Uncomment, oops. We will uncomment this guy out. This is the example that we're trying to fulfill. So if it takes this input and array, a pair of arrays, it should give this output an array of pairs. So in this case, it would be something like, you know, red two, uh, red three, whatever the scores were, so that we know what score is associated with which team. And then we just have some unit tests down here that you can look at in your own time. Code will be at a gist in the description box. And so we're going to implement this in a gross way. This can be done recursively, but I don't want to waste everybody's time too much explaining it. So let's just do by index, and we'll just return x and then the y value at that same index. Again, this could be refactored. And because we have unit tests, it'd be easier to refactor. Let's make sure this passes. Cool. We just have the one failure which will be our team score. But now we have zip implemented. So the next step now that we have all of these teams or all of these scores paired up with a team, we can create a scores array. And this will just be all the scores that we want to add together. So we'll do pairs.filter. And then we'll make a little helper function on the team. And we can just drop this guy in here. So make a function on the team. And it's just going to take one pair at a time. First element will be team, because it's up here. Second element will be score, so we'll just call them T and S. And then we just need to check that the team that was passed in from that pair is equal to the team that was passed in from the user into the function. And so it'll return everybody who was on the requested team. And it'll return their score. But we only want the scores themselves. So let's map over the result of that and just get the second value in that pair. Now again, we haven't written second yet. So let's get this guy out of here. And I'll have to do that. And so now we can write second. Second is just going to take a pair. We can destructure it. And we'll just return the second value. Now there is a very similar variation on this called first. We'll be using that later, but I'll just do it right now where it returns the first value. And we have unit tests for this. Because I already wrote these. We'll make, the, make sure that runs. We'll make sure that runs. Save this, it should fail because I haven't saved this one yet. Second is not a function. Shouldn't go from four failures to less failures. There we go, we have three failures. Okay. So now we need to go back up to team scores and see what we need to do next. So we have our scores. Now we need to add these scores together. So we need a sum function. We just need to return the sum of all the scores. Return sum scores. Now, of course, we haven't written sum yet, so add sum together. Oh, and that's why that was failing, because I haven't commented that. Normally, this is all much easier to see. If you're wondering why this development cycle seems so gross, <laughs> it's because 
Uh, everything's smushed onto a tiny screen and the font is as big as I can make it. So uh, normally it's not quite this bad. Uh, so now we'll write our sum functions. I don't even think we need to really bother with unzip. Uh, so I, won't, I don't think I'll worry about that. But we can do sum. Now sum is just going to use the uh, add function that we made earlier. And it's just going to take an array. And it'll return that input array reduced using add with the identity value, which we know is zero. Save that. It shouldn't care because I haven't actually commented out or activated the sum unit test. There we go. Ran eight of ten. Actually, since I'm going to post this code, I will actually write unzip. Just so you guys can actually see a working unzip. It is the reverse of zip, as you might expect. So if we go to zip, zip takes a, a, a pair of arrays and returns an array of pairs. Unzip takes an array of pairs and returns a pair of arrays. So we'll just call it pairs. And we'll just take all the firsts. And all the seconds. Again, none of these are necessarily optimized or super efficient, but it gets the, uh, the point across. Firsts, seconds. Another point of this, showing all this, is to show why people use libraries, because a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't want to use external libraries. I get it. I get it. The, the, I, the love of writing your own code is certainly there, and I understand. But at the same time, this is so tedious. And these are common patterns that we already know from other languages. And they're implementing in things like uh, Lodash. <coughs> Seconds is not defined. Oh, it's just because right there. All right, and now that we've written the last function that we needed, our sum function, everything is passing. So team score is passing, which is excellent. All of our parts are working together. Now, there's actually a bug in team score, but we can't tell from our unit tests. Maybe if we wrote enough unit tests, we would see it, but a uh, generative test will show it to us very quickly, assuming that it generates the random test necessary for it to fail. All right, so let's hop over to our generative tests. Uh, main. And so we have a couple properties here. And this is what generative tests are really good at. They're just, they're really good at reflecting these user stories that we want to represent. So we know that no matter what the table is that we're given, team score should always return a number greater than or equal to zero. I'm calling it positive number. That's neither here nor there, there's probably a better way to describe it, but you can see that it should be greater than or equal to zero. We are not going to accept negative numbers, excuse me, which makes me think up here, this should actually be positive ones. Don't worry, I'll run through how this works in a minute. Uh, but this is a property. We know that no matter what array of scores we're given, because we're only accepting scores at a lowest of zero, then the result should always be at least zero. And down here, we should remain, we should maintain behavior as the table changes. So it's probably super common for you, if you work on a team, for someone to look at you, maybe they're from a product team, or they are your manager, or just another dev on the team that says, okay, it's great that you wrote this function, but is it going to work when we start adding columns to this table? Or have you done something weird like hard code the, the index of the table, or something like that, you know? Well, you want a test that can actually say, yes, this will continue to work no matter what changes around these columns, as long as those columns still exist. So we have table.team added to a random table so that we can still guarantee that these columns exist, but the rest of the table has totally changed. So we hard code these values in, these are our columns, and that way we can say that we expect the result to still be 10. So the behavior should not change, this is the exact same from our unit test if the rest of the table changes. And you can see we're passing in a value called table 2. So what is table 2? 
Table 2 is a randomly generated object with absolutely any key value pairs. And then we're just taking that completely random object and squishing table.team and table.score into it. That's the only guarantee we have. And then up here, we have another randomly generated object, except that we are going to guarantee there is a team and a score uh, property, but those values are entirely random. So we have guaranteed that they will be arrays, so they'll fit our data shape, but they can be of any string or any positive integer. Because those are really the only limitations we've put on this input. Now, we'll see, we'll see if the randomized test hits the bug or not. There is a bug in here. It's come up sometimes when I've run this, not come up other times. But uh, this is going to take a long time to run, or at least it took a long time last time. So let's run these tests. And in the meantime, I will monologue a bit to you about generative tests. If you want to learn more about generative testing, somewhere that you can look is on YouTube for, I believe his name is John Hughes. He wrote a library or a tool for Haskell called QuickCheck. And what it does is it is property-based testing. You describe properties of a function and then it runs a bunch of tests to make sure that that uh, property holds true. Now you'll see the first test passed, which is kind of a shame because I was hoping it would fail. But that's one of the things with generative tests. You would want this to run every single time that you had your build process or something like that. And because it's entirely random, there's no guarantee that it'll catch a bug on the first try. It generated 100 random inputs, but it still passed. The, uh, the benefit here is that there's always a next time. So it could catch the bug before your user might catch a bug, which is great. It generated 100 random inputs. In those 100 random, it didn't find the bug, but it could have, and next time it also could. And there's no guarantee, unlike with unit tests, where unit tests are always the same every single time. The generative test will be different. So there's a chance that in the next 100 batch, it could find the bug. Now, uh, as I was saying, uh, QuickCheck was designed for Haskell. And the reason why I'm making a video about generative tests today is that Rich Hickey, who wrote Clojure, uh, seems to be a big fan of generative testing. And Clojure script is a compiled to JavaScript language, and, which means that it's probably going to find its way, if it hasn't already, into JavaScript as a fairly common testing paradigm. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be your main way of testing functions. They definitely have a certain scope, a certain applicability. Unit tests will definitely be better for your minute-to-minute um, test-driven development cycle, but it fills in a lot of those gaps. The test that I was hoping would fail here was actually for the possibility of having a, uh, a team without a score, so if the team value, or if the team string, or sorry, <laughs> team array had one string in it, and the scores array had, was completely empty, then it actually returns NAN, which is a bug. And I found that earlier after I thought, oh, um, this is great, all my tests pass, and then I ran it one more time before recording, and it failed, which is what you're seeing at the top of the screen right now, where it has all the errors. <coughs> Excuse me, and I was like, oh, awesome, I can show them in the video. But uh, that sort of describes the hit and miss part of generative testing. There's always a chance that next time it would catch that bug. But that's the basics of generative testing. Let me run, I'll run this one more time while I'm signing off, and we'll see if it catches it. Uh, that's the, the hit and miss of generative testing. You have to really know your properties and make sure that you're actually testing for what you think you're testing for. But it allows you to make these much broader claims, things like, Yes, this will continue to work. There you go, there's your failure. Uh, this will continue to work as the table changes over time. That's tough to do with something like unit tests because they're so specific. So anyway, this is the bug. Uh, it's, I'm not sure if I'm going to bother waiting for the rest of the test to run because they're quite slow. Uh, but you can see how this gives you variation. Whereas with unit tests, unless you have a race condition or something horrible like that, they're always going to pass once they pass. Generative tests can catch you even when you think you're good. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Have you used generative tests? Are you interested in learning more about them? Uh, have you seen them for a long time or are you new to them, sort of like I am? 
And do you want more information about setting up unit tests? I know, for example, MPJ just made his unit testing in JavaScript series, so I thought it would be redundant for me to cover it. But if you want to see how to automate with something like Jasmine, let me know, and I'll be happy to make a video about it. I just don't want to bore everybody. So thanks for watching. I'm going to let this red F sit there, sadly. And oh, actually, see if I can, I can, I can scroll up. This is what it looks like. Team score should return a positive number. The, this is called uh, shrinking, where it shrinks their failing case down to the minimum uh, value, input values necessary to describe the failure. So you can see that if any string is passed in, even if it's empty, and score has no value, no rosing it at all. So in this case, it would be a mismatch, mismatch of the columns. So this wouldn't happen in a real database where you're going to have an incomplete record. But maybe it could in your real live database where you, know, you think that <coughs> your function is always going to have these set inputs. This would be a case of rewriting your properties so that your, your, your property-based testing so that it matches the real life properties or rewriting your function if this is a possibility for failure. So this is pretty cool. It shows, it doesn't give you a really complex output. It gives you this nice simplified one that says, no matter what the string value is, if there's any string value and there's no score, then you end up with NAN, which is neat. So see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.